The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Well, good morning. morning. It's good to be here. It's good to be in a house that God is building, that Jesus is building. And the title of this message, and don't get scared, is From the Tree of Life to the New Jerusalem. And we're really going to do that, but um, just in broad, total concept kind of way. Um, You know, the Bible is a very, very consistent book. Um, I'm always big on getting total concept, though. uh, It's easier to know where to plug things in when you have total concept. We had a um, program that Vicki used for the children to teach them, first of all, the general Um, outline of the Bible in a very simple way even for young children and then later and she made a um, mural on paper and they they um, kept it up in the Sunday school room and then when the Bible stories were added um, based on what subject the teacher was teaching on they could go to that total concept and see where it fit in in John in God's general outline of salvation. Um, So from the tree of life to the New Jerusalem, there are two main matters covered in the Bible. Life and building. When you go back and you look at the Bible as a whole, it's all about life and building. God built First of all, he built a garden temple in the Garden of Eden. It was not like the later temple because there was not sin at first and there did not need to be any offerings or sacrifices. It was God with his children. Now, unfortunately, when Adam sinned, what was life at first became separation from God and death. But God started with life and a building all the way through the Bible. Now, the devils built stuff too, but God built Noah's ark. God had a tabernacle built, a temple built. Now, we know that the devil, on the other hand, built Babel, Sodom, Babylon in the book of Revelation. And if you look throughout history, and it's true, even the history of this nation, God is always at work. You know that song, Waymaker? God is always working. Even when we don't see it, God is working. He's always working. But guess what? The devil's always working too. And I had a um, graphic that I made based on a vision that I saw um, when I was teaching American history of what God was doing in America, in the world. But then God would move and then the devil would come right afterwards and do something evil. And and God showed me it was like a history scene on this beautiful golden um, sphere. It looked almost like a coin shaped. And on the top of that golden sphere, God was building a shining city on a hill. And who in here, this is a little off subject, but who in here knows that there have been two covenant nations in the history of the world. I know you know it. Two covenant nations. Israel, of course, we know Israel, and God's covenants are forever, aren't they? And who knows that when God started starts something, he has a destiny for that, and he will eventually bring to completion 
we know that Adam and Eve sinned, th things got messed up in building the nation of Israel. The children of Israel sinned, they went into captivity, but we know that it's going to culminate ultimately in a beautiful new Jerusalem. And in this new Jerusalem, Jesus is the cornerstone bringing Jews and Gentiles together as one new man. And someday this is going to manifest in fullness. The other nation is America. America was built, was created by God based on a covenant that the pilgrims came and before before they even moved into the, to the land, even before they got off the ship and started settling their families on the soil of this nation, they made a covenant, the Mayflower Compact. And they dedicated this nation to become a nation founded on God and His Word a nation dedicated to the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And then the very first settlement in Fort Caroline near Jacksonville, Florida, French Huguenots, I don't know if you know about Huguenots, this is my ancestry, the French Huguenots who were driven out of France, hundreds of years of a war against the Huguenots, men, women, and children. It said that at one time the rivers of France ran red with the blood of the French Huguenots who'd been slaughtered by the king's soldiers and by the Catholic Church. But Jean Ribot came over here, first settlement, and what did he do? He dedicated this first settlement to God and not only to God, but for the purpose of creating a house for God, a dwelling place of God in the Spirit in this land. A dwelling place of God. And this theme was picked up during the first great awakening that America was to be one nation under God. Now, it doesn't look real bright at this particular time in history. But just like we know that eventually the New Jerusalem will be complete, the covenant made, covenants made over this nation will be fulfilled. And God is after nations. He wants, our, he wants individual salvation. But the ultimate prize Father God promised to Jesus was sheep nations. And there's a division going on in the earth today and, and God is shaking things out and God is working in the nations. He's promised the nations as an inheritance for His Son and we know two of those nations are going to be America and Israel. God's covenant nations. And I'll tell you what, I hope I'm around when this land becomes once again one nation under God, a dwelling place for God in the Spirit. Our God is a building God. But God has specific requirements for His building materials. Now, we have a couple of new houses built next door to us. And when the builder started building and every every piece of building material that was brought over by the builder and placed on those building sites had a purpose. It wasn't a trash heap. It wasn't a landfill, although for a while it looked like it might be because there was so much rain when they started building these houses. We thought they were never going to even finish the foundation. I mean, I don't know if you all remember um, last year in the winter when ah, it was always raining. And so they would start something over there and then the rain would come and wash gullies in the red clay and they'd have to send out their equipment once again to, um, to even the land. And they kept cutting the cable for our telephone, our landline, the internet, and, and in the process of this. And, and 
I cannot tell you, it had to have been about six times. As a matter of fact, it got so that when Dennis called Comporium, they recognized his voice. But there was a purpose to all those building materials. And the Bible talks about this with Abram, that he constructed an altar between Ai and Bethel. And you may have heard this before here, Ai means a heap of stones. Bethel means a house of God. And for much of the past 2,000 years, since uh, 100 years after the day of Pentecost, there have been too many gatherings of believers that were just heaps of stone. And yet Jesus said, I will build my church. Now, I believe part of that is, has been for lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding of how to even function in the spirit. When we went to New England, everywhere we went, we had to teach people how to receive. We had to teach people the location of the door of their heart. We had to teach people how to forgive. It was like, I think the church is in preschool. And so there been, there's been a lack of knowledge of how-tos. As a matter of fact, uh, a man of great spiritual authority told Dennis, he, ch he chastised Dennis, and he said, stop saying that you guys are the how-to people and you're teaching how-tos. He said, you are bringing to light truths that have been lost to the church for almost 2,000 years. You're revealing mysteries, secrets that have been lost. And I agree with that. And I think that's one of the reasons that there have been heaps of stones. Now, the other reason is there's been a lack of life. As a matter of fact, we get the God amount of life going in here, and it's going to attract because people, are, especially the young people, they have to have life. They need life. They don't want, they're not interested in religion. They want the life of God. They want the presence of God. And right now we are not a church. Did you know that? God said, you are birthing a church. Birthing a church that is, will be built by Jesus. Matthew 16, 18. This is Jesus talking to Peter. And this is the first time the word church, which actually means assembly or congregation, uh, is used in the Bible. And Jesus said, says to Peter, I say to you that you are Peter, meaning the, in the uh, Greek that means a little stone. But on this rock, speaking of himself, I will build my church. Jesus only builds with life. Today he only builds with the life he has produced in us, the reality of him that, that has transformed our lives. 1 Corinthians 3.11 says there is no other foundation but Jesus, there is no other foundation on which our life must be founded. Now, it's one thing to read or talk about Jesus' life. It's more important to experience him as life. He's the one who is the foundation stone of the temple. He is the cornerstone on which Jew and Gentile with which Jew and Gentile are aligned, and eventually he will be the capstone or the crowning stone of the New Jerusalem. It starts with Jesus and it ends with Jesus. Actually, I think when God told the children of Israel in the book of Deuteronomy, be holy for I am holy, they maybe could have gotten a clue that they could not do that 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 was asking an impossible thing. And that's why Galatians 2.20 is so awesome. We don't have to try to be holy. We don't have to try to be like God. We don't have to try to do anything. We yield to the one who is holy. And it says, and he is made unto us holiness, righteousness, and wisdom. 
He is made to us. We yield to him and the one who is holy, the one who is wise, lives that in us and through us. Now by our natural birth, we are nothing but clay. And they say that at funerals, that from dust we came and to dust we go. Jesus doesn't build with clay. As a matter of fact, did you know that those six water pots at the wedding of Cana were not clay pots? Remember there was a group that was popular maybe about 20 years ago, the young people listened to called Jars of Clay? Those were not jars of clay. They were carved out of stone. They were made out of rock. And because they were made out of rock, clay could not seep into the water that was used for purification and in Jesus' case became wine. In order for clay, by the way, this clay to become stone, we need a stone element, something from the outside to come into us. something that will cause the clay to be transformed into living stone. There's a place in the Bible where it talks about that um, the stones for the temple were cut out of the quarry far away and then brought and set into place so there would not be the sound of a hammer or chisel heard in the holy place that God was building. But Jesus calls us living stones not because we're living human beings, because we're stones that are intended to be filled with his life. There needs to be a transformation. Now, a pearl, by the way, we may be clay, but do you know what happens with a grain of sand inside a pearl? The pearl secretes a living substance that builds up in layers around what was just a piece of dirt until it becomes a precious stone. And speaking of precious stones, whoever read Revelation and thought, uh, it talks about a white stone, one who overcomes will be given a white stone, and you thought of a nice little pebble like, you know, smoothed out in a riverbed or something, it's not talking about that kind of stone. It's referring to a diamond, a precious stone, something that's been transformed. You know, a precious gem starts out as just a plain old rock. But then because of heat and pressure, it becomes something rare and precious with minerals that are aligned in a certain way so it sparkles when held up to the light. It's a transformed stone. Jesus, our Melchizedek, our great high priest, picture the high priest under the old covenant. He had a breastplate and that breastplate was covered with precious stones and he had precious stones on the shoulder. And our Jesus, wears us close to his heart and upholds us by the power of his might, the shoulder, <coughs> a type of strength. And when he goes into the heavenly holy of holies, he takes us right there with him because we're on his heart and he bears us on his shoulders as precious stones. And we see that the new Jerusalem is built with precious stones. Now you look back to the Garden of Eden and there were precious stones there. God created Adam and Eve. He, well, he created Adam, but then the word for Eve is he built a wife because Eve did not come directly from the clay. She came as a living substance. And by the way, the bones in our body are a form of living stones. So he, crea he created Adam, but he fashioned or formed or built Eve, a bride. We are being fashioned, we're being built. 
for Jesus. It says that he gave himself, not just so people could be saved, but he gave himself for us, for his church, because he wanted a bride. And so we are being built now as a bride. Now, because of Adam's sin, the building materials that we see in Genesis, and do you know there are building materials in Genesis? There's a, there's a river, and it says that all through the land there was gold, bdellium, and all sorts of precious stones, and bdellium's pearl, but it was never built into anything. Because of Adam's sin, no building took place after Eve, and they were driven out of the garden. But the subject is introduced. In the book of Revelation, we see almost a reenactment of the first situation that we're introduced to in Genesis. First of all, notice when you read the messages to the, the overcomers in the book of Revelation, in three of those, it's talking about eating and drinking. What Adam and Eve lost in Revelation 2.7, we are promised that those who overcome will be allowed to eat from the tree of life in the paradise of God. And that's the first promise for the overcomers. We're going back to Eden, guys. We get to partake of what they forfeited. In Revelation 3.12, it says, He who overcomes, I will write on him the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. That's our spiritual habitation, guys. That's what we are promised. That's what we can access now. And then Revelation 2.17 says, To him who overcomes, I will give a white stone, a white stone, a diamond. Then in Revelation 21, 10 through 11, 18 through 21, all the way through 22, it says that John was carried away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and shown a great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone. The construction of its wall was jasper. The city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundation of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. And I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple, a habitation of God in the Spirit. The verse that God gave us for Kingdom Life Church was Ephesians 2.22, a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And several times during our worship, I've seen a throne set up in our midst. The vision that Dennis got when he was planting his church way back when he was in his late 20s was the Tabernacle of David. No partitions, no separate rooms. God just right there with his children coming in to worship him in his presence didn't have to go through the rooms like in the tabernacle in the temple. And what did God say he was going to rebuild in the end times? The tabernacle of David. Now, and then, oh, what does Peter call us? In 1 Peter 2, 5, the, the first one who was called a little stone, that we are living stones being built up a spiritual house through Messiah Jesus. Ephesians 2.22 20, talks about members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple of the Lord. Well, so that takes us from Genesis to Revelation and God's plan for building. The bridge book in the Bible that summarizes, that brings all this building together is the Gospel of John. It is a bridge book bridging the Old 
life and building with the now and future life and building of the Bible. Now, three of the Gospels are called synoptic uh, Gospels, and that means that they pretty much tell the historical, um, the history of Jesus and what happened. Um, But the Gospel of John offers us a very unique perspective. Now, when I started reading the Bible, I was told to start with the book of John. And so before I started reading the rest of the Bible, I read the book of John over and over and over again. And I don't think I got around to Matthew right away. But when I finally did go to a church, because I wanted to be sure I went to a church that believed the Bible, not like the one I grew up in, that taught me, um, I don't know what they taught, liberal, um, they taught leftist theology is what they taught, liberation theology, which that term was coined from the churches in South America that really taught communism. They taught Marxism, actually. So um, I wanted to make sure I went to a church that taught the Bible. And so I went to this church down the street from where my parents lived, and the pastor's wife, you know, I went in, I said, I've gotten saved, what do I do? And so she invited me to a Bible study, and they were teaching the Sermon on the Mount. And John is such a dear and precious book. It's all about who Jesus is to us and what Jesus has done. Well, the Gospel of Matthew is the Gospel of the King with the kingdom and kingdom citizens and kingdom requirements. And so when we started studying the Sermon on the Mount, I thought, this is outrageous. Nobody can do this. I can't do this. And so I think it was a while before I went back to the Gospel of Matthew. And now, of course, we know that we can't do that. That it has to be Jesus living that in us. But but the Gospel of John is a very unique perspective. It's divided into two sections. The first section is the first 13 chapters. And those teach about the Lord's coming what it means to us. His, you know, starts off with just the first chapter is an amazing study in itself, but it's the coming of the Lord Jesus to bring God into man. First of all, Jesus lived it. This is what uh, it looks like with a man living as an expression of God. But the second section, the last eight chapters are the Lord's going in death, but coming back to us in resurrection so that he can live his life through us. Now, John is filled with all these amazing allegorical pictures. Um, The chapter one, we have the word, the light, the tabernacle, the lamb, a stone, the heavenly ladder, the dove. Chapter two, we have the the water pots, we have the wine, the temple, Father's house. Chapter 3, the serpent on a pole. Chapter 4, Jacob's well, living water. Chapter 6, the living bread. Chapter 7, li- rivers of living water. Uh, chapter 9, the, the spit and the clay. In chapter 10, the door, the fold, the flock, the pasture, the shepherd. In chapter 12, the grain of wheat. Chapter 13, foot washing. Chapter 15, the vine. That's one of my favorite chapters. The vine and the branches, chapter 16, the woman and the child, and chapter 19, the bone, the blood, and the water, chapter 20, the breath, and chapter 21, the sheep and the lambs. Amazing. I mean, you could teach, you could write a book about any one of those allegorical symbols in the book of John. Good idea, write a book. (laughs) I still want to write a book about the fruit of the Spirit. If you want to um, read about living the fruit of the Spirit as a real experience, the only place we have that written is in the children's book, Gold Goes to the, um, goes to the School of the Spirit. And we taught the, the um, second through, Dennis taught the second through the fifth grade over at CSCL, a Morning Star K-12 through school, and they loved practicing how to do the fruit of the Spirit. And I'm going to talk a little bit about doing some of the fruit of the Spirit before we're done here. 
but I want to know, I'm just curious, who in here started reading the Bible with the book of John? A few of you. How many people in here, the book of John is one of their favorite books in the whole Bible? That and Isaiah, I just love those books. Okay, but the Gospel of John, and we're going to mostly talk about chapter 1 because it succinctly says everything we really need to know about life and building right there in chapter 1. It's a unique perspective, and it's the key to the whole Bible. The key to the whole Bible is found in the Gospel of John because it's how to build God's house and what material to use. And talking about this nation as a covenant nation, Isaiah 66, oh, oh I want to total, go on a total rabbit trail right here. Um, you know, right now we're hearing people say that America's founding was bad and say things about the founding fathers. Um, you know, well, how could you believe what they wrote, what John Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal, equal, that they were endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And people will look and say, well, some of those were slave owners. Some of those founders were slave owners. Well, I'll tell you what, they inherited a system that was not consistent with the vision they had for all men to live as equals. They inherited a system, but almost from the very beginning of the founding of this nation, as soon as the Revolutionary War was over and at first uh, the country was in economic shambles, um, and so they were teetering on anarchy for the first few years, but as soon as some solidity came, Benjamin Franklin was actively working with William Wilberforce of England, and by 1806, slavery was abolished. The slave trade was outlawed in America and England. The problem was, then what do you do with those who are already part of this system? And as we all know, that because of the economic situation and the invention of the um, the Eli Whitney, the um, cotton gin, the Southerners did not want to give up their cheap labor. And so what happened, and by the way, there was a, the Second Great Awakening was mostly in the north of this nation because the Southerners dug their feet in and they chose the economy over God. They chose what they wanted over the founding principles of our nation. And so thank goodness for the abolitionists in the North who had a vision like our founders and set out and fought a war to free the slaves. I mean, that is really amazing. Hundreds of thousands of men lost their lives so all men could be free in this nation. So don't let anybody tell you that this nation had a faulty foundation. And you know what? John Adams, most of you know John Adams was one of our founding fathers. His son, John Quincy Adams, was so grieved that the Southerners wouldn't give up their slaves and that the vision of the Declaration of Independence was not yet complete, that this tormented him and it was a subject of great prayer in his life and he did something very unusual. He was elected president, but then after his presidency, he went back and was elected to the House of Representatives. No other president has done that actually took a lower place. And in that, while he was there in the House of Representatives, he met another representative, Abraham Lincoln, and gave him the plan of this is how the slaves can be set free. And of course, we know that the Civil War was fought uh, because the, they weren't, Southerners were willing to go along with that plan until after the war and they had no choice. 
he had given Abraham Lincoln the plan to bring this nation into the fullness of what was intended. And by the way, that the Statue of Liberty, it doesn't really coincide with that poem the, that's, that's on the base of the Statue of Liberty where it says, the, bring the teeming refuse to these shores. No, the Statue of Liberty r doesn't say, bring them all here. The Statue of Liberty is the golden door showing all nations Look to America for a way to make your nation free. Look to America for, as a plan to make your people free. So if you hear people say that this was a bad nation because it had slavery at the founding, now you know the truth. Okay, the key to the whole Bible is in the Gospel of John. How to build God's house. The Gospel of John right off speaks of life and building in the first chapter. John 1 verses 1 and 4, in the beginning it gets right down to the, the very basics. In the beginning was life. It says in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and in Him was life. In him is life. And not just eternal life, meaning we go to heaven someday. In him was the life that needs to be worked into our nature. That's how we become a living stone instead of just a dead lump of clay. Chapter 1 begins with life, but it ends with disciples, living stones. And verse 142 speaks of a stone called Peter. Now going on through John, which the whole Gospel of John is life and building, in John 14, this was the big event at the Last Supper, not just uh, what Jesus did for us in the past as far as um, shedding his blood for us and his body being broken for us, Jesus is so excited. This is the first time he laid out God's entire plan, the, God's whole mystery of godliness. Jesus laid out for them in John 14. He explains not, he talks about, in my Father's house are many mansions, not meaning that someday in heaven God's going to build us a nice house. The Hebrews call the Holy of Holies in the temple Father's house. He was saying there's going to be a tabernacle of David and all my children, there's room for all my children in Father's Holy of Holies. And moreover, we know that God is with us as the Holy of Holies in us, but he wants us connected through the one who joined heaven and earth together in the Spirit. He who is joined to the Lord is one Spirit with Him so we can be in two places at one time through Jesus. And by the way, right after, right after it was explained, hey, this is going to be spiritual. You're not going to be separate. I'm going away, but I'm going away so that I can die and be resurrected and connect you so you can be an expression, an expression of heaven on earth now. And then John 15, right after that, he explains, and you're going to be connected to a life source, a brand new life source. You're going to be connected to the vine. And who knows, the branches don't wander off and just reconnect only occasionally. For a branch to stay alive, it has to be connected to that vine. And then in John chapter 17, he explains the principle in that prayer, what's going to happen. There's going to be unity when you all stay connected to the vine, when you all, all stay in life. Now at the end of chapter 1, Simon 
was brought to Jesus by his brother Andrew. And Jesus gave him a new name. We know it speaks of that in Matthew 16 also. Jesus gave him a new name, Cephas, which means a little stone. In the same chapter that tells us that Jesus' life, a stone is chosen for building. And actually several stones are chosen for building. We learn that life regenerates us. It works in us. It transforms us. That life enlightens us. Life must come before building. That's God's order. And in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus is introduced as the Lamb for our redemption and the Holy Spirit rests upon him for what, for what purpose? For the building. We have the life of Jesus and the Holy Spirit starts messing with us. It's the Holy Spirit who does the nitty gritty work of conforming us to the image of Jesus. And why does Jesus build with his life and his life only? Because our human nature can't join to his nature. Second Peter 1 4 says that we must be partakers of the divine nature. Remember the gold as well as the precious gems that was found in Genesis? His divine nature is pictured by gold. The Holy Spirit works life into us and then, if we cooperate, he can build us together with other believers into a congregation, an assembly, a local church that is knit together by bonds of peace and the bond of love. That's in um, the book of Ephesians is the bond of peace. The fruit of the Spirit is the cement. The fruit of the Spirit is how, how we're supposed to relate to one another. That the fruit of the Spirit is explained in nine different expressions. It's all the love of God. And the love of God is a living love. It's a living love. It has life in it. Now the purpose and function of a stone Jesus explained to his disciples that he was the fulfillment of Jacob's dream in the Old Testament. He said, speaking to them, particularly he was speaking to Nathaniel in John 1, 48 through 51, says, I say to you, you shall see heaven open, speaking of the heavenly holy of holies, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. He doesn't say Son of God. Here speaking of his deity. We've taught in the past that when Jesus was, because Jesus became fully human while he was fully God, that he opened a way. So there's, um, I'm not sure where the verse is, but it talks about the Spirit of Jesus is the Holy Spirit that we have combining His humanity with His divinity. So because we are human, we can connect with Him in His divine humanity and we can be joined with Him in the Spirit. And then guess what? He can live the perfect human life that He lived on earth through us and the key to all that is the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is such a tremendous concept as well as a tremendous reality in our lives. Bob Jones said it's the only gift we can give to God is the fruit of the Spirit. It's the only acceptable offering we can give to God. We can't give our spiritual gifts to God. The spiritual gifts are for other people. What we need to concentrate on is living in the fruit of the Spirit and letting Him transform our lives. That's why living in peace 
is such a huge thing. It's the evidence that we're abiding. It's the fruit of the Spirit we can, that we partake of most of the time, that we enjoy most of the time. Now, sometimes we can have compassion for somebody who needs physical healing, and compassion is a key for uh, releasing miracles for other people. But the fruit of the Spirit, such a simple thing. Do you know Jesus, most of Jesus' life was just very simple. He didn't stand out. People didn't, uh, were in awe of him when he was a child growing up. He only had three years of ministry. Most of that he was spent living as not quite ordinary human being, but he always loved and he always expressed the fruit of the Spirit in his life as a perfect man. And this is what counts with God. Jacob had a dream in the book of Genesis 28, and he used a pillow, used a stone for a pillow, and slept with his head upon that stone and had a dream of a stairway with the angels of God ascending and descending. And remember when we've studied about the, um, the way that the Torah was studied in ancient Israel, as soon as Jesus talked about this particular verse, they instantly knew what he was referencing. They knew the scriptures well enough. They knew they, that he was talking about Jacob's dream and seeing the ladder and the angels ascending and descending, descending. They probably could have told you exactly where that was located in the Torah. Jacob called the stone Bethel, meaning house of God, a building. And the next morning he poured oil upon the stone on the day of Pentecost, Jesus himself poured the oil of heaven out on the earth in this new house that had just been formed by the one accord they had in the upper room. And Jesus blessed it by pouring out his oil. The house of God, the church, a dwelling place of God was birthed. And this was not to be a one-time event. It was a truth of what is going to happen in places all over the earth because there hasn't been a lot of building done in the past 2,000 years, but boy, are we getting ready to see a bunch of building. I was hoping we'd see it in 2020. So far, um, well, let me explain a little meme to you. I saw, you know what a meme is? It's a picture with uh, given a, a, an updated meaning. So who in here is familiar with the old movie, Back to the Future? And there was a bad scientist with his long white hair and his bug eyes and uh, his magical time machine car. And then there was Michael J. Fox, his little disciple. And he was sitting in the car with the, with the um, doors open, speaking to Michael J. Fox. And he said, whatever you do, don't go to 2020. <laughs> and I thought that was really funny. So I'm saying, God, are we going to see some good this year? And we know that God is shaking and it looks good to God, but it doesn't look so good to those of us who are living in the midst of it. So the house of God was birthed when Jesus poured the oil out. And you know what? The Bible says that this promise is for us and for our children's children and for as far off and as many as God will call that that promise still holds. Something else happened. A living organism was birthed. I'll tell you what, there was a lot of life in those stones, living stones meeting in that upper room. They had just been utterly broken and humbled by the events of the crucifixion saw their dreams shattered, everything that they believed was, was challenged and shaken. They learned they couldn't trust in their intellect or anything that they had already known that this was a new way that they were going. And so they were very humbled people. See, God won't 
God looks for those who are poor in spirit. The, in the, um, the description of the citizens of heaven in the citizens of heaven in the Sermon on the Mount, it starts with blessed are the poor in spirit. They were poor in spirit. And it really takes those who are poor in, in spirit to be able to humble themselves at the foot of the cross, which is the narrow gate that leads to the highway of holiness. There needs to be a new life walking in holiness within us because we don't, our human nature has no holiness. It has nothing that God could possibly use. Nothing good is in our flesh. In John 14, Jesus says, I am the way. He is the spiritual connection. He is the ladder. He's the truth, the reality. This is the reality. He's going to live his life through us. And because he is reality, we can live in reality, not playing church, not, not joining a club, not, not doing religious stuff, but the reality of him living his real life in us. And of course, he is the life. Heavenly places connected to earth, the greater glory and the greater works. In John chapter 14. So how are we going to do this? It's really very simple. Christianity is not a religion, but life, and life is a living person living in us. When we're saved, the seed of life is implanted in our hearts. John 1, 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Life enlightens us. Life gives us light. Before we were saved, we walked in darkness. And I think a lot of people who are saved and haven't really come to Jesus as the light are still walking in a lot of darkness. The more life we have, the more light we have. John 8, 12, Jesus spoke saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. When we yield to Jesus in our daily walk, and that's what following Jesus is all about. It's in the small things. It's in the small moments. It's in the tiny steps that we take. There aren't times that we take, there aren't many times in our lives when we take a huge step. Like, that's kind of limited. Like when we get married or, and so forth, that's pretty huge. And, but most of our life is lived in the midst of small steps. When we yield to Jesus in our daily walk, the seed of life grows and bears fruit. John 15, 5, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do, you can do nothing. Can you see how valuable a peace walk would be? That's evidence that you are staying connected to life and light. Now, what happens as we walk? The Holy Spirit enlightens us. We can see right from wrong. We can see good from bad. We can, we can um, become sensitive. The light of life is a sense of life. It's practical. The Holy Spirit is very practical. By his dwelling, working, and living, there is this sense that enlightens us on what to do practically in our daily lives. When we have the life of the Lord Jesus in us, there's a feeling and consciousness that we have because his spirit bears witness with our spirit. We can get a sense of, don't do that, don't say that, don't go there, or why don't you do such and such for somebody? And the Lord can lead us by this, the light that comes from his life. When we lose our peace, we sense we've separated from God, but we know how to get back there. So the Holy Spirit wants to guide our steps. He wants to be a lamp for our feet, for our walk. 
and life can grow. How does his life grow in us? Picture a cotton ball. If you put a little bit of red ink, say for the blood of Jesus, in that cotton ball, and you keep adding red ink, eventually the ink will grow and expand and eventually saturate the entire ball of cotton. That's how Jesus' life grows in us. Now, when we get saved, we have Jesus in our spirit, but then, as the wise and foolish virgins know, then we need not just our spirit, the lamp of our spirit lit, but now we need to let the Holy Spirit fill our soul, our mind, will, and emotions with Jesus' life instead of our natural life. And that comes through the work of the cross. We die daily. His life increases in us. Only the Jesus formed in us counts to God. Everything else that we have is useless to him. Paul said in Galatians 4.19 in the Amplified Translation, My little children for whom I am again suffering birth pangs until Messiah is completely and permanently formed or molded within you. The closer we draw to God, the more light and life we experience. And by the way, right now in our small groups, Sin and indifference separate us from God. Indifference, we just don't, we just don't um, care, don't put forth an effort when uh, we're told to pursue God, to diligently pursue. And Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you search for me with your whole heart. We do need to pay attention to what's going on in us. And the best way to do that is with other believers. John Wesley's accountability groups. And then we're told in Didache, the little short teaching that the apostles used to disciple new Gentile believers, they were told to confess their faults to one another regularly in the local meetings to get serious because, see, there's some things that we can kind of dance around when it's just us, some things we can deceive ourselves about. Um, but when we're committed to being fully known and fully loved in a small group of believers, we can open our hearts and get rid of the little sins of seed that if they're not removed, will grow. And we do not want sin growing in our lives. We want Jesus growing in our lives. And of course, we know that the Methodist, John Wesley used the phrase to watch over one another in love. So actually, iron sharpens iron. We, in our fellowship with other believers, when we get real with people and expose what's really going on with us, our, our failures as well as our victories, then we grow closer to each other. We actually start growing and increasing one accord with one another. So we're growing closer to our brothers and sisters in the Lord, and we're growing closer to God at the same time. I mean, that is a really good deal. So in our small groups, it's very precious. I hope you don't take it lightly that what God is doing here, he's working, he's, he's causing life to grow up in us so that when the outpouring comes, when the awakening is fully underway when God is creating little Pentecosts all over the earth like I saw in my vision. We're going to have enough life for him to be able to build us together into a house where he can come and live. That's all God's really wanted. He's been looking for a house where he and his children can live together right from the very beginning. And 
if God desires it, I believe it's going to come to pass. Even, even if we don't know whether it'll be this year or 10 years from now, it's his desire and he's prophesied it and he's going to do it. But he does need people to cooperate. And then that life will flow out of us in actions. When, when the Bible talks about um, living stones, living works, as opposed to dead works, living works are actions with life flowing through them. So we, what we taught the little children, we had good deed cards. And they could cut them out. And what they were to do with those good te- deed cards were they were supposed to pray and ask the Lord to show them something good to do for somebody else. And then while they were doing it, so it wouldn't be, okay, God's told me to give you my toy. No, you let love flow out and flow through that good deed when you're doing it, and it makes it living in the little things in life. Do you know every moment is a seed that's an opportunity that you can take something and and bring it from the natural realm into the supernatural realm through letting life flow through it. When you're making the bed in the morning, you can be grateful to God. You can worship God in doing that, and it takes it from just being something you have to do every day to making it something supernatural that has life in it. And it's increasing the life in your life. Making the bed, doing the laundry, making coffee for your husband in the morning, unloading the dishwasher, driving to work, being on the road, having a slow person in front of you. You can, the Bible talks about redeeming the time for the days of evil. That, for the days are evil. That's redeeming the time. It's taking that moment of time and transforming it into supernatural living works. Be aware of that. I, I remember some hearing um, the first two years when I was married, living down in Waycross, Georgia, I lived in a house that didn't have a dishwasher with it, a little rental house. And when I got a dishwasher, I really appreciated it. And then I would hear women talking, oh, I hate to unload the dishwasher. You know, to this day, I am thankful to God when I unload that darn dishwasher. I appreciate having it. How many things do we just take for granted in our lives that we can actually lay up to our account in heaven, in the heavenly places, through transforming every opportunity, step by step, walk by walk, walk by walk, um, action by action. We can transform. We have, what an opportunity. We can lay up treasure in heaven in doing things we don't ordinarily like to do. That's really good news. We can live by the fruit of the Spirit, and in doing that, it really is terribly significant for our lives. Every moment is an opportunity. And that brings me to the peace challenge. We might need to dust that off and bring it out and live by it. What the Lord spoke to Dennis was, don't let anything come between what you and I have together. That's practicing God's presence. Practicing God's presence. Bringing his life into our everyday life. We wanted to give it kind of as homework, but something that the Lord spoke to Jennifer and I about doing a peace challenge, I'm not going to get into it now. I don't feel led. I feel like that what God is saying, this is too much to comprehend. I'm going to give you one thing that I know God's saying to do. This is, she gave the big picture with a lot of detail. But in reality, this is the thing that the Lord gave me before. Peace is the only true indication that Jesus is ruling in your life. And it's the only legitimate wall between people. Forgiveness breaks the wall and puts peace between God and man, between God and... But 
God gave me this verse out of uh, Zephaniah that the process of what he's building is it has, there has to be a conception. Just, it's just like childbirth. There's conception, there's incubation, and there's birthing. And then there's growth after birth. I believe that we're entering the season since Pentecost to where God's giving people a choice to conceive. We prayed it in the beginning before Jennifer preached. To make a connection with the body of Christ. False independence is of the devil. God never made anybody to live independently as a believer. To say I'm part of the body of Christ but I'm not connected with anybody is total deception. It has to be real. That would be like saying, uh, a single person saying, I'm married to somebody, I just don't know who they are yet. But I am. Okay. No, 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 that's not. There has to be heart to heart, breath to breath, spirit to spirit. And many years ago when God gave me that vision of a dome and I built a dome church and everything, basically just to honor God in that he was basically saying, the Alpha and the Omega, I am the foundation, no other foundation, and I am the capstone. I'm the beginning and the end and everything in between. But he basically said, Dennis, I'm gonna, I want to have you, I said, I don't know how to pastor, I don't know how to build a church, I don't know what to do. And he says, I'm going to teach them their identity in me, reality. Secondly, their giftings. That was easy. The third part, he says, Hold your breath, you will not see that till the end times. So I'm believing I'm in the latter years here. I'm going to see that one. And it's individual identity, individual gifting, corporate identity. That's going to require you being part of something bigger than yourself. Actually, marriage is a definition of that in a small scale, two or more. You're part of something bigger than yourself but yet it creates something that never existed before. It's a new creation. So what I'm saying and what Jennifer's saying, she's giving you the big picture. But God basically said in Zephaniah, I am in this conceiving this one accord. We all want to see the outpouring ever since Pentecost. I want to see more Holy Spirit. But there's a process of cooperation. And he says, here's the four elements. I'm taking away the proud from your midst. You can't build with pride. That's flesh. I'm going to leave a humble in your midst. Well, that's the good news. <laughs> and when he says, well, I'm going to take away the proud from your midst, he's very patient and long-suffering. Remember that revelation, that woman Jezebel? I gave her a long chance to repent. But you know what? God has a timetable that if you don't allow something to change in your heart, he, He'll do the removing. I'm going to take away the proud, the proud from your midst. I'm going to leave the humble in your midst. The king who casts out the enemy will be in your midst. The king of glory is coming into that house, that habitation of unity. And the God of peace will be in your midst. And He's going to rejoice over you. He's going to sing over you. He's going to bless you. You're going to enter into that corporate atmosphere to where you are functioning the way God intended you to function. And lastly, he said, I'm going to cause you to be blessed peacemakers because peacemakers are mature sons of God. Peace cannot just be a concept, a mental concept. Peace has to be lordship of Jesus. And it has to be a reality. But right now, let's just pray that you become part of something bigger than yourselves and you remove the walls of pride that keeps you in a false independence. False independence. Say that back to me. False independence. Because, you know, when I was a little kid, when I was independent, I thought I was growing up. I'm mature now. No, maturity is when you can become interdependent. When you can basically give and receive. You, you in and of yourself, cannot give and receive anything of any value. 
You were created to be part of something bigger than yourself. So, Father, we just pray that right now there's a conception going on. There's a, a pregnancy, so to speak. You're birthing something in us. When you told us to start Kingdom Life Church, you said, you are not a church, you're birthing a church. Well, to birth a church, there has to be conception. There has to be an incubation where people's hearts change and are willing to become part of something bigger than themselves. Then the birthing comes just like on the day of Pentecost when God birthed the church. But first there was a requirement for the people to have the proper heart attitude to conceive. Right? So Father, right now, I believe that we're basically impregnating with the Word of God, the seed of God, for God to accomplish His purpose. But He's not just an individual God who wants to accomplish an individual purpose. He said, I want to bring a habitation of God in the Spirit by taking living stones and having them come together. You're not going to lose your identity. You're going to become part of something that's a new creation that enhances and gives assignment to your identity. And we pray this in Jesus' name. You've Amen. been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.